Hey, Reject Nation. It's Greg Alba here. And I'm John. Essentially, what we wanted to do was show you guys our live event, but there was a lot going on, and we had a lot to make sure was in order before the live event started, so we couldn't really get a proper angle, and the place we were shooting from was pretty dark to begin with. So basically, what we ended up with was a whole lot of audio and not a lot of great video, but we still wanted to share it with you guys, so we thought we'd throw it up here in podcast format. Along with a couple brief snippets from the clips that we showed, just to give you a sense for which scenes we chose and whatnot, uh, and if you want to see the full scenes, they're all detailed down in the description box as well as the pinned comment. Yeah, so the audio is not entirely the greatest thing in the world. It was such a frantic night. <laughs> it's very day. much a first-time affair yeah, for us. It was our first live event, and we had pretty much sold out the theater so we were pretty anxious about it that we didn't even think about can we record the audio through the microphones that we're doing this into we got to make sure the camera's all set up like there was so much in there that we were just forgot to take care of that day if we ever do another live event like this one we will definitely make sure the audio is a lot better Be like more this prepared. this intro audio is sounding a lot better than <laughs> the audio you guys will actually hear however uh we listen to it and you know if you just settle into it you can easily pay attention to what's going on and so you guys are not confused by how the event went down it was at the Arena Cine Lounge Movie Theater. I want to thank Christian Mel Meloni? Mel Mel Meliani? Mel uh, Me Me I believe that would be Christian Mioli, if I'm not mistaken. Mioli? He's M. A, he's, he's, Christian M. Uh, Christian M. <laughs> he he held, <laughs> held the theater. And um, Stacey Howard, who helped coordinate the event, and Brianne Chandler. Uh, so what we essentially did was we did Brianne Chandler's film therapy segment, where uh, she basically asks us real personal questions that somehow link to film in our lives. And we had one more question just for the live event as well inserted into there. And uh, to make it a little bit more spicy, we put movie clips in between each one of our answers. So Brianne would ask me the question, I'd answer it, then I'd play the clip of the movie that I'm really referring to, something that really resembles the answer. But because this is YouTube, we can't show you the whole clip, yeah, or else this video will get blocked. Tastes. Yeah, we can only give you like a little taste of it, so you'll have some audio, so that way you know specifically what scene we're referring to in which movie we are talking about. But we did want to share this with you guys because people did come out, and Brianne put a lot of work into hosting the event as well. So big thanks to her once again, and thank you to everyone who did show up, everyone who did come out. Uh, incredibly grateful. Uh, because it was one hell of an experience that we had. Uh, we get pretty vulnerable in here, and I don't think either of us were really expecting to get so personal, so vulnerable. And the so crowd certainly wasn't expecting yeah. that either. <laughs> so it's like this big this big hybrid of vulnerability and laughs. <laughs> vulnerability so, and laughs. So if you want to get to know us a little bit better, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the next about 50 minutes or so. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Enjoy and uh, leave some comments below. Thanks, guys. As with every session of film therapy, I have guest patients, and my guest patients today are the real rejects. John, Greg Alba, please come to the stage. I don't think you're good. He's figuring it out. We're here. Sorry, this is social media is important, guys. <laughs> That was a pretty now. amazing intro, and I didn't know how to follow that up, but I'm, you're, you're here now on stage you, with me. Have you guys ever been to, uh, like, a premiere for a movie, for, a, like, a friend's movie? No. And then you're like, man, that was terrible. <laughs> and, and, but the person who made it is so proud of, of that. Sure. I don't know if we're having that moment right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I was pretty entertained. Did we so. finish, what time did we finish it at? It was like 3 a.m. last night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the computer dropped like a good amount of our sequence from the timeline, like right as we were about to put everything together. <laughs> so, you know, we had like a last minute frantic, we gotta figure this thing out! We lost, we lost like two scenes. So yeah, that one hour before the live event is like semi-autobiographical. <laughs> how, how, how close to the wire we were Figuring stuff out. Uh, so I'm sure many of you, probably all of you, have never joined us for film therapy, but here's how it's going to work. Shame I'm going to ask uh, these gentlemen three questions about film. They're the same three questions each and every time, and we're going to add an additional fourth question just for this, mm -hmm. for wild this card. today. Wild card, wild card question. Uh, so the regular three questions are, what is a film that inspires you? What is a film or a scene from a film that triggers a memory for you? Maybe it's happy, maybe it's painful. And what is a film that helps you through difficult times? 
And the one that you asked me to add is also with a film character that um, kind of represents who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes, ma'am. You let's know your get show. started. I just, I just want, I want both of you guys just to keep pointing the mics at me. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm going to be doing, just to make sure that you are well liked. Um, let's go ahead and get started with our first question, which is, what is a film that inspires you? Which one would you like to, which one of you would like to go first? Uh, well, we set up this little slideshow. Jen, pull up that first question if you're out there, my oh. dear. No, she's or got Jordan. it. Watch, look at the scroll at the bottom You're so you know where she's at, so we <laughs> okay. can know where the tech is at. <laughs> just keep watching that. See. Yeah, just let it play, Jen. We just want to pop this question on here. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, so we gave her notes, and we want <laughs> yes. you guys to see the notes, to too. Pop. We just, oh, just keep hitting play, Jen. What is a film that inspires you? My film is a very cliche answer, and that is definitely the first Rocky movie. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, and I watched it, um, I ended up binging it like pretty much right away. And I think especially down the road, that film specifically really hit a strong part in my heart. Hey, that rhymes, I like it that. It does, part of your heart, um, part of your world. Part of my world. Now I know, so what we wanna do is after we answer the questions is roll the clip from the movie. And I know everyone's gonna wanna see like the Rocky montage, JT in the audience, big Stallone fan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or the, you know, the Yo Adrian scene. But we're not gonna do that. We're gonna go with one of the slower, more boring scenes today. Uh, it's the scene right before, the day before, when he is having a talk with Adrian. He's laying down in bed with her. And he's, he's basically telling her that his whole life he's felt like a bum. And uh, I, I really identified with that moment because there was a time in my life where, well, it's not a time in my life, it's just a fact. I didn't really finish high school, and I didn't go to college. Unlike John, who did both. Good for you. <laughs> and for many years, I was just working odd jobs, and uh, there'd be, a, you know, this, I remember my like very first relationship. There was a lot of relatives and family members who just looked down on me, who didn't think I would ever amount to anything. And finding YouTube was a big part of it. And I, what I love about this clip is. It's not about even winning. It's just about not giving up. It's just about endurance. And, you know, as he says, it's about going the distance. And I don't know. I, I feel like we got a lot of clips and I would go into more depth, but why don't we just show that clip and sure. get some momentum going? Let's take a look. General, that clip! Oh, come on, Adrian. It's true. I was nobody. That don't matter either, you know? Because I was thinking. It really don't matter if I lose this fight. It really don't matter if this guy opens my head either. Because all I want to do is go to distance. I'm so glad we played that clip first, because it really keeps the momentum rolling. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it? It doesn't slow down the pace of this show at all for you guys, does it? The one thing I was thinking while we were watching that, and the part about going the distance, I was thinking, is this the inspiration behind Michael Bolton's Go the Distance for Hercules? I think so, perhaps. I was thinking I, I look so much like Stallone, don't I? I kind of got a Stallone look. Do you? Don't, shake, don't shake your head, you people. <laughs> you sick people out there. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh yeah. Tapia. Um, in that Rocky scene when he's looking up at the poster, I believe they actually really got it wrong. Yeah, and that's they why did. they wrote it into the movie that he was going to have this dialogue. Yeah, they did. And not mattering. They did. I mean, just about. Uh, and I kind of like that behind the scenes. I think the whole behind the scenes story of Rocky is fascinating and uh, something that is super inspiring. I think that just adds the extra layer for a film that is already inspirational and knowing just the depths he had to go to be able to star in this movie and to know like all the technical things that went wrong too and how much of a success it is. I was actually listening to an interview with Conan O'Brien before we came over here and uh, he was talking about how everything's gonna be difficult and there's always gonna be obstacles and I think the film behind the scenes and in front of the camera is something that is exceptionally inspiring. John, huh? take it away. John, what's a, what's a film that inspires you? What's a film that inspires me? Well, many films inspire me, of course. Yeah. 
to, today I chose a specific one though. I chose one uh, that came out a couple years ago called Sing Street. Yes. Which is yeah, which is Love an Irish uh, kind of music. It's a lot slower than that Rocky mm. clip. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Slower. yeah. yeah. Fact, Gonna bring it down even yeah. more. Even more. <laughs> Actually, it, it, it's kind of a medley of, of clips because what I learned in sourcing these tonight is that uh, it's really hard to find Sing Street clips longer than a minute online. Mm. So, Are they all just the musical clips? Well, and yeah, as I didn't want to just like put only a small. We're not going to just do riddle of the model right now, is what you're saying. There might be a little riddle of the model. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. That, that's a movie uh, that uh, to, music is one of the m biggest forces in my world, and so I always kind of gravitate towards movies where. It, it, basically a collision of music and film live because that's, you know, my two greatest passions in life are those two things. And that particular movie was one, like the stuff I really want to see and the stuff that resonates with me most is usually the stuff I wind up checking out like when I have a couple hours spare and I'm just on my own. And so that was a movie I kind of went uh, to and bonded with because uh, it was very relatable in the sense that it's like I went to Catholic school growing up. It takes place in a private school, and it's about this. We went. We to, went to the same. We met in first grade in the audience. with <laughs> Alex Romano over there. Yeah, oh um, but it's basically about it's a coming of age story about this kid kind of overcoming his circumstances by uh, creating and, and you know kind of making these unlikely friendships, forming a band, and you know unlocking life the drabness of life that way. And that's kind of what music does for me. That's what uh, friendships have led to, especially like with you and with some of the people even here tonight, the, the sort of creative things that can come out of uh, those little connections that you form and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but the, the clips is, like I said, it's kind of a medley. So the first one is from earlier in the movie where um, the lead character is talking to his brother basically about why do you want to do this in the first place? Because the character starts off very understated and kind of grows out of his shell by the end of it. Spoilers. Um, you know, which is very, again, just a, a dynamic I think we can all identify with, and especially for me, I kind of feel uh, like him at the beginning of the movie, and I'm sort of trying to get to that point of confidence at the end of the movie. But So the first clip is where he's talking to his brother, kind of about to embark on this journey, and then in the middle there's some music, uh, which I will kind of touch on afterwards, and then... Uh, I also chose a clip from kind of later on in the movie to uh, demonstrate both the transformation of that character because of the power of art and also um, because of a couple of the lines of dialogue that are particularly resonant. Before we get to that clip, I want to know, mm -hmm. were the two of you ever a band? And why have you not formed a band if that is the case that you were not? We've made songs before <laughs> for like weird little things. Greg, Only to each other, though. Yeah. yeah, only, songs only to each other. Yeah. We and, live together now. Well, yeah. So yeah. we'll just sing songs down the hall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wake up, Greg. Uh, <laughs> it's 10 uh, but uh, uh, and when did you first learn music or become interested? What was your first instrument? I wanted to play since like I was since as far as I can remember, I would borrow my dad's nylon string guitar and bang on it. <laughs> but it wasn't until like fifth grade that I started taking like third lessons, grade. Third, third, grade. third grade, I started taking like lessons and we had to play the recorder in We class. all had to play the recorder. I'm just realizing this is couples film therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, we've been a couple for most of our lives. That's the way it works. <laughs> and, and my girlfriend has to accept that. <laughs> oh, what's up? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope I did a decent job saying that. We can roll the clip, I think. Let's go ahead. And Damn it, it, Jen! <laughs> Or Let's Jordan. You got it. You don't need to know how to play. Who are you, Steely Dan? You need to learn how not to play econ. That's the trick. That's rock and roll. And that takes practice. Every school has a covers band. Every pub has a covers band. Every wedding has a covers band. And every covers band has a middle-aged member who will never know whether they could have made it in the music industry or not because they never had the balls to write a song for someone else. Rock and roll is a risk. You risk being ridiculed. Part of the reason why I chose the song in there is is for the DIY aspect and those clips overall, because uh, that's something I kind of struggle with in general. That whole part in the beginning where he's talking about like I, I don't know how to write a song. We like, we got to start somewhere. We got to do it right. And at a certain point, you do just got to let go and make things and just sort of play and explore and try things out. And that's something I feel like you are very good at and I need to get better at because I'm very sort of methodical and so I kind of approach things like songwriting like he would at the beginning of that movie and so I'm kind of in the process of learning the art to getting to that place where you're, you know, 
telling off the asshole at school. <laughs> and, and that whole sentiment about, you know, um, you don't know how to create, you know, you can only stop things. Uh, you know, growing up with a lot of opposition from the children around me and stuff, like those, those things, uh, you know, you grow up with bullies around like that, the lesson becomes a refuge, that sort of like, if you can create, and that's what poetry and lyrics and things like that are for me, is, is yeah, a way of uh, processing that, is sort of, yeah, you're a part of my, you're fuel for that for me now, so. I do like how he becomes the security guard later. Yeah, right. Isn't so that I feel like there's a redemptive moment for him as well. Toss that guy off the stage. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's good. Well, let's get into our second question, which is what is a film or a scene from a film that triggers a memory for you? Perhaps it's painful, maybe it's happy. White chicks. I had a very specific okay. situation once. I haven't seen yeah. white chicks, so you're going to have to break it down for me. All right, so dating this girl wasn't okay. All right, so what happened was. Uh, uh, a scene, I, for some reason, you know, the, the parenthesis on this question is happy or traumatic, right? Correct. And uh, I can only think of traumatic things for right. some reason. Or so. so we're going to do that good one-two punch again. I'm going to play a slow scene, and John's going to play something that's a lot more upbeat. Right? Mm -hmm. Kind of. Upbeat. I actually don't know your yes. scene that's coming up. Yeah, you know. We, we only cared too. about We only cared about the sketch. We Are the really... drama masks. Up yeah. one is the sad and one is the happy. <laughs> For today, I'm, the I'm the sad. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or dramatic. Um, well, my first thought was uh, a part of my brain would kind of go to like Raging Bull for a second because um, you know I was a boxer back in the. Now it actually reminded me of. Um, you fuck my so, wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had that exact situation with my brother once. It was really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, no, nah, and uh, the Raging Bull because. Whenever my, some dads get in a bad mood, and whenever my dad was in a bad mood, they sounded exactly the same when they would yell. It was pretty, it was pretty uh, weird when I would watch that movie. Then the other movie that came to mind was Pursuit of Happiness, but the one that really gets to me, like if there's a scene in a movie that really gets to me, it's the one when Robin Williams is telling Matt Damon, it's not your fault. We're gonna have so much fun today, guys. <laughs> We're just gonna play the fun well, stuff. Therapy. I bet you wanted Flubber, just didn't let it you? Go. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, we, uh, yeah, th this specific scene I identify with. I've been in therapy for a few years, and I remember when I first went to therapy, it's a film therapy, it just fits, doesn't it? And when I first went to therapy, I did have a big wall up where I just couldn't remember like the first 20 something years of my life. And eventually, I started to understand what I was learning, but kind of like Matt Damon, um, it's like he could logically see, hey, my cousin Jessica's here, how you doing? <laughs> All eyes on her. Um, when, uh, I'm just talking about therapy right now, I'm just talking about traumatic memories. Um, so, <laughs> where was I? And, and, in, that, in, the, in that scene, it's like he, he's logically able to pinpoint what's wrong with him. But the issue is he can't, feel it and he needs to break through that barrier he needs to break through that wall and uh i used to you know in the, in the years of therapy i was diagnosed with several things ptsd type 2 bipolar and adhd so i used to be really on like a lot of medication and a big part of being able to get off meds and be able to heal and grow is learning to embrace the emotions first is to embrace it so you can start letting go and uh, another part of this scene that i think is really powerful is when he's saying it's not your fault it has me think of a quote, which is, um, it, the quote went, take full responsibility for your life. What may have happened to you now, up until this point, is not entirely your fault, but from now on it is. And I kind of feel like in this moment, it's him taking charge of his life and not being dictated by his past experiences. Did I say that well? Did that come across well? Do I sound intelligent when you I talk? Do. Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, <laughs> Carly's like, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At what point did you decide, like, I don't want to be taking this medicine anymore? Two weeks ago. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Today. <laughs> Today. I wanted to sound and inspiring. what was that journey like to get um, off of it? Uh, it, was, it was a year a year and a half ago, actually, uh, when I, I, I had gone through a, a, a breakup. I used to go by his personal name, Ryan Ryan, on the internet. And then when I wanted to change that and I wanted to just embrace myself, the process of it was very challenging. Because I was on like Adderall 40 milligrams, which was very addictive. I was taking that every day for years. And then I had to start weaning off of that. And I, it was a lot of weaning off and a lot of exercising. But I took up, 
you know, we're LA. I took a meditation, and uh, I do that every day. <laughs> yeah. That's right, meditation. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Do that patient shit. Uh, yeah. Headspace? Yeah. Is that your app? That you, do you have an app? I, yeah, yeah, I started off with Headspace, actually. Yeah. Headspace and is a great app, everyone. It is, it, everyone should try it. So I started meditating. Um, I started exercising. And I eventually started dieting. Uh, I, I lost, like, 30 pounds in the course of that. And then the day I realized I lost 30 pounds, I, I met my girlfriend. I was very confident that day. It's all because of the weight loss. Why you're here in that chair today. And the non-money on YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Why show this clip? Let's just talk more about that stuff. So, yeah. Well, I want to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. The audience might want to know, too. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't mind talking about it. Um, yeah, it, it, was very, it, was, it was tough, and I'm not perfect. You know, when I still have my times where I get really upset, but I'm a lot calmer than I've ever been. I'm quicker to apologize, and I'm more self-aware than I've ever been, too. There's people in this room who have seen me in very manic phases, actually. So uh, for those who, you know, I'm pointing you out, this guy right here. <laughs> Al Alan? Yeah. <laughs> How long do those phases generally last? The manic phases? Mm -hmm. Um... Whew. They could go on for hours. They they could go on for hours, and I, I'd be like very belittling and very. It was one of those things where, I was speaking of raging bull, there were times where I kind of felt like I was that guy, <laughs> where I was just getting into a rage fit. I, I feel like I could be kind of emotionally abusive if that was if that was the word for it. It wasn't like physically harming people, but emotionally, which is pretty pretty bad stuff, I think. And uh, yeah, I feel comfortable talking about it now because it's been so long that right. I talk about it. But yeah, I mean. This is fun, right? This is fun. Some fun conversations we're having today. <laughs> well, we're learning a lot about we're you. We're learning that's a lot the point about of me. Film therapy. And John's goes to therapy too, so you better open up about your traumatic stuff that's too. Good. Oh yeah, we're going we on the opposite side of the spectrum in a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah. all right. That's gonna be great. I think really quick, the yes. the, the fascinating part uh, about John and I, and we're so similar, is I feel like some of my uh, a lot of it came from my upbringing, but when I went to school. I was a very different kind of person. We went to the same school, and I was like a funny guy. I had a great time. Whereas John's family, who's right there next to my brother, actually, John's family is like the nicest parents you'll ever meet. I like the sister too. Hi, Diana. But, <laughs> I, but John's parents are like the best parents ever. And uh, but his stuff was like from the schooling time, right? Yeah. 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 We so. had the opposites. I'm gonna we talk about John's school. trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Just expose him for the rest of this. <laughs> yeah. You could probably put it better than I can. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, let's watch that hilarious clip from Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> it's not your fault. Don't fuck with me. It's not your fault. Don't fuck with me, all right? Don't fuck with me, Sean. Not you. It's not your fault. <laughs> Tension and release right there. Do you ever hug your therapist? Is what I want to know. Uh. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be hilarious. <laughs> it's such a weird situation. <laughs> um, I wanted to say too, like, when Robin Williams says, like, you know, like, fuck this shit, this is bullshit. It's. It's not that if you're diagnosed with something that it's not valid. Uh, I think a big part of what helped me let go of stuff was not being defined by what I was diagnosed by. And I feel like that's kind of what Robin Williams is trying to also communicate there. So I don't know if there's anyone in this crowd or whoever, I mean, we're recording this right now, if anyone's watching it, that a lot of times people will just keep using that diagnosis as an affirmation. I feel like sometimes that's, right. that's a good thing to affirm it, and it's a good thing to like uh, get in touch with it. Sometimes, though, it does become a crutch or an excuse. You just leave it at that. And, uh, yeah, so I just really love that scene, and it does make me cry, like, an awful lot. Side note, side tip, crying is more powerful than most medications, actually. Did you know that, Brianne? Uh, I've been crying yeah. a lot lately. Let's all cry right now. Let's do it. <laughs> One big cry fest. 
I feel like a good cathartic cry, man. Yeah. I do like what you have to say about like he's not trying to lower any sort of diagnosis or belittle it or in any way say that it's not valid. Um, there's some things where I feel like, you know, I suffer from depression. I feel like um, I there are days where I'm like, I wish there was a catalyst for this. Like, I wish there was a reason why I feel this way, but there's not, and then I just feel like bad that there's not. Right. And then it's like, great, we're just going in the circle yeah. over and over again, just in a circle. <laughs> but that's life, that's life of depression. <laughs> Let's talk about happiness oh, now, John. I mean, not, not, not the happiness. Change the mood, John. <laughs> In fact, I mean, the, the movie I chose is a happier film overall, but the scenes I chose are kind of on the angstier side. I, I approached this, this night partly because I'm indecisive. Uh, but also Gemini, so I tried to pick things that have a sort of dual quality in some way, shape, or form. And uh, I, I thought about a lot of movies because the, the whole, like, time and place thing, like what film triggers a memory? And there's so many of those, especially growing up in like a film household, it's like the Marx Brothers take me back, or Clueless takes me back, or Me and St. Louis takes me back, like movies like that, Zoolander, we're gonna watch a clip from Zoolander. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, so for this one, I chose a movie that I just found, as I recall this, I just found it in the paper one day, they were just doing one of those advanced screenings that they advertise and sell tickets to. <laughs> Uh, which used to happen every once in a while, and uh, that's how I first wound up seeing School of Rock. And School of Rock yeah. is a movie that I really love, and it is one of the like family favorites that I found. So you know, it's kind of special to me in that regard. Uh, but it's also you know the, the the journey of the movie, whimsical though it may be, is about a guy kind of shaping up his life, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of frustration in it that gets aired out both on the kid side and on you know the Jack Black side. And uh, the two clips I chose, uh, I, the first one is a pretty noticeable monologue, but the highlight for me is the second clip, because uh, there's at least one speech that Joan Cusack gives to Jack Black that uh, just resonates like so hard with me, because I'm a pretty anxious person, um, and you know, social situations, people uh, really trip me up. And, um, my mind is always crunching at every moment, no matter who I'm talking to, no matter how comfortable I ought to be with them, just every moment has me wound up. And that's actually, I think the name of that chapter that I chose for that second clip is called Wound Up. And the first clip uh, kind of echoes mine and many people's just frustrations with life in general. Um, because that's the side of me I don't air as much. The frustrated side of me I don't have a good line to, I'm not very connected to, I don't know how to express. It's funny, I, I feel like in a way we have uh, if we isolate toxicity <laughs> and make a yin-yang out of it, you have the angry half and I have the sad half. And so like... That's right! <laughs> so, so one's much more kinetic than the other. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's kind of... Um, um, these, all these questions kind of lead together for me a, a little bit, you know, this is, yes, could also double as a... Theme in your choices. I yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. This is this could be easily question three or something like that. But um, but yeah, in terms of like a time and place, this does conjure kind of a joyous memory because I was a bonding days with me and my dad. We went out and checked this movie out. I just thought the kid who was the drummer looked cool on the poster. <laughs> uh, and, you know, cool is what you want to be when you're not and you're growing up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so School how, of Rock. How old were you when you saw this? What year did it come out? 2003-ish? <laughs> Four? Yeah, four. 13, 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to look through our eyes as the 13 year old when we watch this clip. Yeah. Roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> I wasn't always wound this tight. There was a time when I was fun. I was funny. But you can't be funny and be the, the principal of a prep school. No, and, and if anything goes wrong, it's my head in the smasher. These parents will come down on me like a nuclear bomb. I can't make a mistake. I gotta be perfect. And that pressure has turned me into one thing that I never wanted to be. No, you're yeah. not. Yes, I am. I am a big one. Her faces are amazing. They are, they are. She's terrific in that movie and every other. Do you, does this make you want to be a substitute teacher at any point no, in your no, life? No, I used okay, to teach children know. improv comedy, and okay. that was very challenging. What age is? Incredi four to eleven. Okay, well that's your problem right there. That is a big range, number one. I don't have the mind for that. Okay. You're a teacher. 
I was a, I'm was a former teacher. I yeah. do still have my credential. Um, the one thing that bothers me about anything that's in a classroom is they go about with a chalkboard behind them, which is in no in no classroom <laughs> ever is there a chalkboard. So smart why are board. we still doing this? Hmm. Yeah, it's a smart board now. Yeah, so look, at that, look at that. It's an almost good touch screen. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so do you feel like the way the world is coming down on you, you can't be, you have to I just keep it all in? feel very wound. I mean, like, swap, granted, none of my stakes are as high as several parents at an overpriced school, but, you know, I, that's, those two monologues are kind of the dueling voices I have to stave off in my head a lot of the time, because it's easy for me to feel dejected, like, what's the point, you know, because especially mental struggles are just kind of perpetual, and you have to train your brain against them and acknowledge that some days you're gonna be low, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so I, I guess I kind of chose those, yeah, as sort of one half of the frustration and then the other half of just everything to a degree equates to that level of pressure. So I spend a lot of time tense in ways that I've only just recently started to acknowledge are also physical, like, you know, you'll, you'll feel tightness or butterflies. And when you actually catch them and realize that they're sensations you don't feel at all times, then you realize, oh, maybe everybody doesn't feel like this. You know, maybe that is me. <laughs> and uh, or parts of me anyway and so yeah that's, that's kind of where that medley came from how do you feel right now uh, I, a little jittery I, I'm mostly worried that I'm not articulating these things well enough <laughs> and I'm wasting everyone's time <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also having uh, uh, in the, the background there's a fun program running <laughs> haha <laughs> Getting to know us, guys. That's right. Let's get into our final question. Final? Yeah, we have time. Uh, what, what? Uh, What's the third word? question. Yeah. Yes, the yes. third question. The third question, yeah, yeah, that's true. We did prepare uh, for what is that? What is a film that helps you through <laughs> difficult times? Uh, we already brought white chicks in. Uh, yes. I would probably say, okay, my answer to this one is... I just want to say really quick why I love Brianne, because Brianne's the one who came up with film therapy on, on her channel. And the reason I love her segment is because it reminds me of two things. One is, um, it does, when I hear conversations on film therapy, it does remind me that films, even subconsciously, we might not realize it, are an escape. And another thing, too, is we can also identify with people, and, and sometimes you get some good inspiration from people as well. And the movie Eight Mile really does inspire the hell out of me. We're gonna rap battle now, people. Let's do it. <laughs> um, in the movie, it kind of goes hand in hand because I I've seen I I, I know about Eminem's personal life because we're buddies, you know. Yes. Marshall and I talk. Um, in the movie Eight Mile, it's the final rap battle. If you guys haven't seen the movie, uh, we're gonna spoil the whole damn thing for you right now. In the final scene, when he's doing his rap battle, because early on in the movie, he's just trying to be another rapper. And in, that, in the finale, when he's doing his rap battle against Anthony Mackie, Falcon from Avengers, uh, he this doesn't really even insult him for most of it. He kind of just insults himself the whole time. Right. Because he's embracing all these qualities about him that oftentimes we're told to like not showcase, to not be vulnerable about or feel ashamed about or feel guilty about, and instead he embraces it. And I think just Eminem as an artist is a big thing that's inspired me about him, is uh, he's someone who just kind of embraced all the craziness in his life and just put that on public display, kind of like a public therapy. Kind of we're getting meta here because I'm saying that a film there. Isn't that also and, his yeah. like defense? Like he's playing defense. Like if I say it first, he can't say it back to me. So yeah, that's exactly. why he's, he's not gonna have anything to say. I've heard a big part of letting go of anything or being able to grow is just first embracing it yourself. And I feel like in that in this scene that we're gonna show as a final wrap out, is he is just doing that. He is embracing all the shit people have given him and all the things he knows are shitty about his life, no matter how bad it can look. It's just this ability to not care, to not give a shit. And I feel like when you get to a point like that where you just don't give a shit anymore, uh, that can be life-changing. Of course, there are times where I give a shit. I kind of give a shit right now. 
Of course. I, I hope so. Well, you guys know. The awkward. There so, the <laughs> when you're having a bad day, you're like, I'm going to turn on 8 Mile right just, now. Yeah, but you got to get to the finale. Okay, <laughs> so just to if let you know, just, it's like watching the pursuit of happiness and not watching the ending. Just like, I'm depressed now. You, know? you got to get to the finale of this movie, and then once you get there, you're like, that's right. Fuck everyone else. I'm just going to embrace me. Yeah, and I feel like this movie does that. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's see. Pretty much his role. There's energy in this clip, unlike the other ones. Yeah. Are you going to rap with it? I don't right? know. Do we okay. all, who, who knows the rap to this song? I'm sure many. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Damn it, Jen, play the clip. <laughs> this guy ain't no motherfucking MC. I know everything he's got to say against me. I am white. I am a fucking punk. I do live in a trailer with my mom. My boy future is an Uncle Tom. I do got a dumb friend named Cheddar Bob who shoots himself in his leg with his own gun. I did get jumped by all six of you jumps. And we did fuck my girl. I'm still standing here screaming fuck the free world. You'll never try to judge me, dude. Yeah, no, I mean... So uh, now you're going to do your own rap battle right now. Right right now. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone in the crowd. <laughs> John's parents, come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I feel like I kind of said everything. I know we tend to do the thing where I set it up and then we talk about it after. But... Move over, Greg! <laughs> I, I do, um, I, I feel like whenever I get back in that state of, it's, it's like there's a fine line between not caring about people or not being considerate uh, and then not caring what people think about you, you know? Like there's a difference there and uh, not letting opinions dictate you. And sometimes I can still fall into that habit, but whenever I see that, or listen to a couple Eminem songs, I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I forgot what your answer was for the next one, John. Oh, good. It'll be a surprise for everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for the next one, I actually chose a couple again to kind of stitch together. One is a more intense moment, and then the other one is a much welcome moment of levity. Uh, but basically, I chose a clip from both Paranorman and a clip from Swiss Army Man, uh, because both of those are, are movies that I would kind of call on for difficult times. One, you know how you like listen to an aggressive or, or a sad song when you're feeling that way to kind of get that out? That's kind of why I chose Paranorman, and then the opposite end for Swiss Army Man, because there is as, as much uh, life and melancholy as there is under the surface of that movie, there is also this weird, palpable joy. Uh, I've never seen a movie quite like Swiss Army Man, and that's another one I, I considered actually for the second question, because uh, I just so remember the time that I saw that. I mean, how can anyone forget when they see Swiss Army Man? It's it's the uh, really original it, film that an, you just don't forget. Yeah, it's it's inexplicable and, and uncanny, and I, I find it interesting that that movie uh, starts out, you know, with a guy trying to end his life and then learning, uh, kind of confronting life and and uh, learning the value of it through his strange, whimsical interactions with the corpse he finds washed up on the beach. Um, so there, it's a very strange. I see you like. Raising an eyebrow, Mom. <laughs> it is a very strange movie. Um, but going back to the first clip, uh, you know, growing up was not always the easiest. Like, at school especially, like, with the other kids and things, um, you know, people weren't overly friendly. Even my friends weren't overly friendly. Uh, and so, y you know, the clip goes into a much broader context. Not you, you were good. <laughs> Sorry. Some of those people were there. Uh, and I don't know how you remember it, but I remember how I remember it. Uh, but Paranorman is a movie, again, with like a really easily identifiable character for me, because, you know, it's my kid who like loves horror movies and stuff, and that's me. <laughs> and uh, I've always felt a little bit misfit, as I think a lot of people do, but, um, you know, especially growing up, just, you know, being given what for a lot of the time from the people around you, you can start to get very warped and angry. And one thing I realized over time as I got to know more people in high school who had the same kind of story as I did was the places that you fall after that and the way you process that information can be wildly different. And so I'd met people who um, had, had, I feel like those experiences growing up, dealing with, you know, people being shitty to you, uh, have taught me a lot of my best qualities. They've also given me a lot of my worst qualities, but they've also taught me a lot about understanding people and about understanding what is personal and what is just the byproducts of other people's circumstances. And that's kind of what this clip cuts to, is uh, what people do 
with their um, traumas and also their fear. Fear is another big sort of force in my life that I am trying to dismantle and rail against because, you know, anxiety is just the hyper-concentrated version of fear. It's just the kind of like, what's the outcome going to be of every moment? And uh, it, especially seeing that movie for the first time, I was like, wow, this was not... The message is more sophisticated than I was expecting for a movie that is, you know... I feel like every animated movie gets just kind of packaged up and pitched as kids. But uh, Paranorman, to me, is more of just like a family-accessible movie with a message that was so much more nuanced than I thought it would be about fear, what it does to people, what it causes people to do because they just don't understand. And, you know, I mean the movie borrows from the witch trials and that's just one big lesson in what people do when they don't get it and are freaked out and i feel like we are all subject to what people don't get and freak out about a lot and i feel like so many conflicts arise because people i feel like a lot of people attribute conflict to people being conniving or malicious when it's truly to me the opposite is just people not thinking enough or considering enough or getting enough in touch and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's why I chose the Paranorman clip. And then after that, partly for the levity and partly for just the opposite side of that coin, because both of those movies have a darkness at their core, a melancholy kind of aura, but uh, one is a, a little more in that vein, and the other is much more joyous uh, to kind of, uh, you know, interact with. And so uh, one of these is very intense and dialogue-driven, and one of them is very sensory. God, he's so good with the vocabulary. I do it's what like I can crazy. <laughs> try. Sometimes. <laughs> Let's see it, Jen. Let's do it. They hurt me! So you hurt them back? I wanted everyone to see how rotten they were. You're just like them, Agatha. No, I'm not. You're a bully. No, I'm not! Sorry, man. They're probably thinking, what? Yeah. Did I just watch? <laughs> it's a very, it is a very unique and, and strange movie. But it is one that, um, especially, I don't know, partly why I chose that clip, A, was to be a palate cleanser, and B, uh, was to, it, it, just the visual representation of the joy of life, uh, I thought was a nice thing, because I feel like life is beautiful, and I have a tr hard time tapping into the joy of living it. And so that clip especially, like the movie itself is kind of, again, about a guy learning to want to live again and learning about the joy of life again through this weird little experience. And that's, you know, in terms of like what helps you through a tough time, that sort of lust for life is very palpable from that movie for me. And it just is a creative type uh, that movie inspires me also just because I have not seen very many movies like that at all. And... Um, uh, I had something to say about that first clip, and it's kind of dissipated from my mind at the moment. But uh, <laughs> well, I've never seen Paranorman, but I felt like that clip really um, compartmentalized how the thought process behind why someone is a bully, mm -hmm. um, which could be something that maybe I would show to my daughter, because it's something that she's uh, seven years old and and has been dealing with, you know, some sadness with a friend and. And knowing that it's not it's not about her, it's about the other person's internal struggle that they're going on with them. That was one of the most important lessons I, I ever learned in life. I feel like that that kind of helped me because I have met like when he talks to her, then he's like, "No, you're you're doing exactly what they do, just in a different direction." Like I've seen that become so many people that I've met over time, where you'll see the the mean streaks that come out of people because of the justification that they were you know, treated that way themselves, so why shouldn't I give this back? And I understand, uh, I've, I've always kind of seen that instinct, and it's not one that really clicks with me, and I think that's kind of indicative of, of why, is that message, for whatever reason, got through my head really young, and I'm grateful for that. But when I saw this movie, yeah, I kind of had a similar thought to what you said just now, is like, we see a lot of kids' movies with a lot of 
messages about being you and, and that being okay, and that's a good message too. But when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's a unique message, and that's a well-expressed uh, message, and, you know, it's easy to feel preachy, and I don't feel like that movie gets preachy hardly at all, so, yeah. I'm going to check it out. Check Please it out. do. And if you like horror at all, it's, it's a lot of fun. I haven't seen either of those movies, but I completely understood everything that went on. Okay, good. Yeah, that was, that was easy to did. follow. Super I think easy that Swiss Army Man it might still be on Amazon Prime if you have it, but... I will make sure to add that to my queue immediately. Add it. That's probably how John got the clip, okay. So we have a fourth question. Yeah, the last one of the night, people. This you guys it. have endured. This is all I appreciate it so much. Uh, who is a character you especially admire or identify with in film? Batman. Of course. <laughs> that's exactly. You wanted to talk about that. I just want to talk about Batman. That's why you were yeah. like, what could be a, a question that we could do yeah, with I mean, Batman? My mom's still around, so that doesn't really count. Martha? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny how you said the sad, angry thing, and I'm about to capitalize on that right now. Yeah! Uh, I, this movie, when I saw this movie, there's no movie character right now that when I watch it, I go, I identify with that character. I can't think of a movie right now. I'm just that unique, people. Um, but when I watched this movie at this time, I really did identify with it. And then once I tell you the movie, you're going to be like, well, yeah, Ryan Gosling and Drive. Obviously. Can't you see it? This is so apparent. Um, you are a stunt. I'm just that badass. I've done so many crimes. He doesn't speak really, though. Yeah, that was totally me. No, what <laughs> was... Um, what I identified about that, I mean, and that's kind of a performance that's sort of open to interpretation, I guess. But at that time in my life, uh, I did feel like I was a rather empty guy. And I see that performance as a dude who feels empty, but then feels emotion for a girl. And in those times, I'm not even referring to like specific girls at the time in my life there. It was more about like if you had a crush on someone or if I was in a relationship. And when you do fall in love, you do want to be like a protector, a hero, but then sometimes that can be like a dark romance that sort of forms from that. And uh, like, I'm grateful now that the relationship I'm in is the best relationship I've ever been. It's like, <laughs> shake your head, no turn, pressure. stand up, and then shake your head. <laughs> no See, like, I, I can joke like that. <laughs> but then she'll yell at me for joking like that. <laughs> I'll do it now. You can do it now. <laughs> No, and, um, and that, there's the scene that I'm going to show, and if you guys do not like violence, you're going to want to turn away on this one. It is the most violent scene in the whole movie. Whoa. It's the head-smashing scene. Oh, amazing. Who has seen Drive in this crowd? Half the crowd. Oh, dear. <laughs> no one in the yeah, front row. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, I'm glad you guys have a front seat or this one. <laughs> not you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, there's this half right here. <laughs> um, yeah, in, in this moment, I think... <laughs> I think, hey, brother, tone the volume down. <laughs> That's a nice microphone you got. Oh, wait. <laughs> Love you. Um, it's, in this scene, what happens is he k finally kisses the woman he loves, or I don't know, has feelings for. I don't know if he loves her. It kind of seems like that. But then afterwards, he exposes the side in him that he's always kind of feared to show her, and then she's kind of scared of that. And at that time, but don't worry, guys, because right after it, I have another clip that is very tonally different than this one. And I think I just wanted an excuse to play this clip, because it's one of my favorite scenes of all time. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jen, where are you? I'm not going to be watching. You this. should watch. I mean, I've You'll seen it. it. That's why I don't watch. Yeah, that's exactly oh. what went down that day. I lost 30 pounds and I killed some guy now. Okay. <laughs> wow. Just like, now I'm ready. Let's so, do it. Let's keep this <laughs> All right, so, okay. Now, the next scene's from Dumb and Dumber. Oh, All right. <laughs> Not even joking. Oh. It is. And the reason why is because as a, a, guy, a guy who's a movie buff might see a scene like that and go, 
identify with the emotions of that guy. I want to protect my woman like that. And then there's a scene in Dumb and Dumber where he's fat. Who, who, has everyone here seen Dumb and Dumber, most people? He's fantasizing about when he meets up with Mary and how he would like meet the family and he'd be the highlight of the party and he would save her, like stand up for her and be a badass action hero at a restaurant. And to me, that's more of the reality of my life. <laughs> Like, I watch Drive, and I go, I'm so much like that. And then I'll fantasize about, like, saving my girlfriend or something. And I'm like, oh, I am this stupid, aren't I? Like, when I watch Dumb and Dumber, like, this is never going to happen, is it? So, uh, yeah. Let's play that scene from Dumb and Dumber to show the real version, real version. of how boys fantasize about protecting their women. But even the fantasy part where I love is he gets his ass kicked by the uh, chef first, and every time I fantasize about being a badass in front of my girl, it always starts with like, I'm able to take a few hits first, and then I can fight. But it's never gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> the situation will never happen. But I will- You have to go first. I have to go first, okay. yeah. That's where we're at. And I need weapons, too. It's okay, I'll fight you. <laughs> so John has- Lose! Uh, yeah. character that you admire and or I yourself with. Uh, yeah, okay, so I uh, chose a couple for this last one that are on the lighter side, all right! <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I, the first one, uh, you know, I, I view myself as an awkward guy, and uh, especially when it comes to socializing, talking with human beings, you know, off the doming it, kind of like what we're doing right now. And uh, <laughs> feel free to use that in your spare time. Uh, uh, so the first clip I chose was from a film that we uh, saw first at a test screening. Uh, just, you know, time placing it again. Shout outs to question two. Uh, but we saw I Love You, Man. And Paul Rudd in that movie, I identify so, so hard with. And um, the scene I chose is pretty much every conversation I attempt to have, at least from my point of view, with most people. <laughs> and uh, the second clip I chose is from my favorite film, uh, which is Ed Wood, which, uh, again, shouts out to question two. Uh, it always takes me back to uh, my, my one of my dearest friends back there, Aaron, and I saw that on my 20th birthday at the stroke of midnight at the New Art. Uh, I think it was a film projection, but I can't be certain. Uh, but that's a character who I've always identified with and been fascinated by, mostly because of that movie, and I've seen a few of Ed Wood's actual films, but something about that figure um, as a person who, you know, clearly has the spirit and clearly wants to get out there and make things, but is also kind of terrible at it, is, is like a very real thing that I am, like, afraid of. I think anybody who creates is afraid of being that, is afraid of pouring your heart and soul into something that ultimately winds up laughably terrible. And the message, I think, beyond that, at least the movie's message beyond that, is that it almost doesn't matter, really. And once you can get past that level of, like, it's gotta be great, as long as you put you into it, and as long as you fight for your vision, you know, you do the best that you can with what you think is right, you know, that's what it's really about, that's what creation is really for, that's what all these things are, you know, and, and Ed Wood too, I mean, over the course of that movie, just, you know, he, he looks out for, you know, the people he cares about, and there's just something about that performance, it's a bummer to watch Johnny Depp do whatever is happening to Johnny Depp right now, I feel like Johnny Depp is kind of like a pumpkin, have you ever seen one of those time-lapse pictures of a pumpkin just <laughs> melting? I feel like that's what's happening to Johnny Depp. <laughs> right now and uh, but but that character and the way he plays that character just the energy everything i just i really love and have always been drawn to and i kind of fear and identify with that character all at the same time but again you know that, that movie kind of packs it up in a nice way so th that's my my two last clips here pumpkin. yeah <laughs> the rotting pumpkin uh, sleepy home Roll that beautiful bean, uh, please. Life, you know what to do. Hey, Peter, it's Sidney Clavin. No, that's not right. Oh, uh, <laughs> Sydney, it's Peter Clavin. 
I uh, met you last week at an open house, and um, hey, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say. What was I saying? Ah, uh, Mr. Wells, is it all worth it? It is when it works. You know the one film of mine where I had total control, Kane. The studio hated it, but they didn't get to touch a frame. Ed. Yes. Visions are worth fighting for. Why spend your life making someone else's dreams? Thank you. What? We made it through. We made it through the clip. Now I'm never gonna think of Johnny Depp other than seeing a rotting pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, so That's for you guys. It's a super new <laughs> Whether you, you see a pumpkin make... or Johnny Depp, you'll be reminded. There you go. Uh, plan 9 from Outer Space 2 is that, are you going to be making up? That is, yeah. Hollywood just called. Jeff Hollywood just called. Okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, we got a hot take. It's coming back into, into vogue. We need to remake. They tried to remake Plan 9, you know that? I did. There was a that. teaser trailer and everything, and it didn't happen. <laughs> that's the movie that he's, if you haven't seen it, what, that's the movie that he's making right there at the end. Yeah. And that's probably the most heroes. famous yeah. movie, I would say. Although there are a few that, that I just secondhand caught the titles of growing up. If you have a psychotronic book on hand, <laughs> you'll see a few of those. But yeah, I don't know, just that, just that, um, I've never viewed myself as a person with tons of audacity, uh, but I guess that's kind of what I take out of a clip like that, and especially the little, the nudge from a hero that's sort of like, visions mm -hmm. are worth fighting for. That was my senior quote, actually. <laughs> Why spend your life making somebody else's dreams? Um, but yeah, you know, like that, um, just that fortification of, yeah, audacity. I feel like that's kind of a theme that runs throughout that movie. It's like he even comes out in front of the crew. He's like, I gotta get comfortable, so I'm just gonna wear the Angora and the wig and be comfortable and direct. And like, in weird ways, I admire things like that because I'm like, oh, I'm usually very kind of packaged up and trying not to discomfort anybody else around me. So, um, not that I, you know, have that same predilection or anything, but just that uh, openness to just kind of go for your vision uncompromisedly, not second guess yourself every step of the way. I think he could have used a little second guessing, <laughs> perhaps, but um, but yeah, that ultimate theme, and you know, as for the creative realm at all, like that movie has always really inspired me and also really uh, resonated with me. And yeah, there's, there's a reason why that's my, my favorite movie, I guess. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, Greg, thank for you. Uh, joining me for this session of thank you for film yeah. therapy. And thank you, Stacy and Christian, for letting Stacey. us have you. Thank you all who came out. David Candy, I want to point out, uh, he gave us these shirts that we're, we're wearing, and he drove like six hours to come here tonight to support us. One of our top patron supporters. And uh, and we know like half of you guys already. So <laughs> how you doing, friends yeah. and family? <laughs> you guys doing good? <laughs> yeah. I feel like we went on a character arc. We're like we start off a little bit on the you know the the downer side, our foot and then we get on the <laughs> the upper no, side. Home. Right the end, We're right? gonna do a song and dance right now. Oh, you're gonna do that for us. Let's okay. do it, man. All right. Ah, it's not so easy when you yes and, is it? Uh, <laughs> so long. Not a hell <laughs> and. <laughs> and what? <laughs> what? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. That's it. That's it. We're done. We're done. <laughs>